Good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to be here. It's my honor and pleasure to be with you again this year. We was here last year, and it's really been nice to see all of you again and to meet new people here as well. So what I'm going to do today if I, is to give you an update on what's been happening at NIH. Um, and this is my talk is on behalf of the Trans NIH ME CFS Working Group because this couldn't, the work that we've done over the course of the last two years could not have happened without the 24 individuals who are really dedicated and working hard on this Trans NIH Working Group. And I'm pleased to introduce Joe Breen from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, who's here and who's been my partner in crime and has been a fantastic partner to work with. Um, I told someone last night that I'm not sure what I would have done if I would have gotten a jerk to work with from NIAD, but <laughs> it's so not the, the case with Joe. So it's really been a pleasure to work with Joe. Um, so I think the good news, um, or the start of good news, is this graph that shows that from sort of a stable level of $5 million in fiscal year 17, we funded close to um, $15 million, and that's from about seven, about half of that from investigator-initiated grants, and the other half from the new centers and the Data Management Coordinating Center, and we hope that this trajectory continues to climb. That's, that's the goal, that's the idea, and we're hoping to really keep to stimulate research um, as we move forward with launching the centers. So as you know, at NIH there are two parts to the National Institutes of Health. There's the intramural research, which is the research that actually takes place on the NIH campus. Um, and then there's the extramural research, which is where Joe and I work. And we are, we are program staff that oversee grants that go out to investigators outside the NIH. And so I'm going to give you an update on both. So first of all, the intramural study, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, which is led by Dr. Avi Nath, is ongoing at the clinical center. They've had really great success, I think, in bringing the patients in. So the latest update is that they now have had 10 healthy control study participants complete phase one, and two of them have returned for phase two, and I'll explain what those phases are in a minute. Um, and 10 um, individuals with MECFS have been to the campus to participate in part one. So phase one is where they bring people in, and this is a picture of Brian Vestag, who came to NIH to participate in the study. And you can see him here in a picture. Francis Collins actually went over to meet with Brian when he was on campus. And the picture on the other side there is Brian all hooked up doing the tilt table test. So phase one, they bring them in and do a bunch of evaluations, draw blood, do imaging. Um, it, but they pace it out such that the individual is really able to meet the demands of the testing that's being done. Um, and then phase two, when they bring them back again, weeks to months later, is where they will do an exercise challenge and again, do multiple numbers of measurements. So this is moving well. Um, Dr. Nath is very pleased at the pace at, and they've got people scheduled out to come in um, the goal is to bring in 40 individuals with MECFS, 40 healthy volunteers, and 40 individuals who are post-Lyme disease. Um, so I think it's moving along and moving along well, and I know that they've had tremendous, uh, um, pe tremendous number of individuals with MECFS contact NIH wanting to participate. So that's not been a problem with trying to find individuals to participate. So, what have we at the Trans NIH Working Group accomplished? Well, in the last year, Joe and I both participated in two different professional meetings, one at the Sleep 2017 meeting in Boston and one focus, which is the Federation um, of, Organiz of Immunology, Organ the Clinical Immunology Organizations. I'm a neuroscientist. I can't remember these immunology things. So um, Joe and I both participated there, and I think the goal was um, really to bring awareness of NIH's interest in MECFS, to give an update to the communities about what's going on, and get additional individuals 
interested in participating in MECFS research. And I have to say that I think we were a little disappointed, especially at Focus, about the lack of attendance, but we were up against another really popular session. So, but the people who did attend were really engaged and interested, and I think that was a really fantastic session. So we funded three centers and a data coordinating center, and I'll come back to that. And we're fostering now international discussions. Um, we're just about to sign a memo of understanding with Canada, who is going to fund a center in Canada to participate in our consortium and collaborate with the US centers, which is really fantastic. We've had outreach from Australia and the UK, which we're working through. So I think this is eventually going to become a worldwide effort, which is actually very exciting. One other update is that in partnership with the CDC, we've been working on common data elements, and many of you in the room have participated in this effort. And what this is is a way in which to define a common language for clinical studies on MECFS. And so we've had, I'll jump to this, numerous working groups over since I guess they started in January, February timeframe with training sessions. And we've had numerous groups who have been come together on a regular basis with teleconferences working hard to really flush out and discuss what are the common data elements that if, for example, you're going to be studying sleep in MECFS, what are the data elements you would like to collect in a study, ideally? What are the instruments that could be used? And how should those be reported? So that everyone begins to do that on a uniform basis so that you can start to combine and compare across studies. So this effort has really moved along well uh, also. Um, and we've had healthcare professionals and ME stakeholders involved in all of the groups. And I have to say, my hat goes out to those volunteers, especially the individuals with MECFS and the advocates. I know Mary's been very involved, Lily Chu, um, help me, I forget some of the other folks who've been involved, Denise, yeah, Jenny Spatellas, and they have really put in a tremendous amount of work. And it's really the first time that patients and patient advocates have been involved from the beginning. In all of the other common data element projects we've done, they have come in at the end to comment on the work that was done by the healthcare professionals. So it's really been a learning experience for Emmis, but I think it's been a tremendous experience for us, and it's really brought tremendous value to the discussions to have them involved from the beginning. So the working groups are currently finalizing what is called their packets of work, um, doing an internal review. So all of the working groups will review what the other groups have done, and then it will go out for public comment, hopefully in December. Um, and then a finalized um, common data element package will come out hopefully around February, March timeframe. Um, the one last thing I'll say about this is that it will be, once it comes out, it will not be carved in stone. So it's meant to evolve and change as we learn more about the disease, as we learn that this test works better than that one, or we should be reporting something a different way. So it's meant to be ever evolving and to really move with the field so that it, it's not stagnant, but it's really serving a purpose for, for research on MECFS. Um, the centers, and this has been really exciting. So we worked very hard for about a year, I guess, more than a year, to develop the two RFAs that were released. We were very pleased with the outcome and the, re the applications that came in. It went through a peer review process. And in the end, the three centers that were funded were um, Ian Lipkin's group at Columbia, Maureen Hansen's group at Cornell, and Durya Unamats. I know Durya's here. There he is, Durya at um, Jack's Labs in Connecticut. And then the Data Management Coordinating Center was awarded to Rick Williams and his group at RTI. And you can see listed, it's kind of small, but listed after each one of them are also the collaborating institutions and organizations that are also part of each of these applications. So it's not as if it's just Columbia, Cornell, and Jack's Labs, but there are many other individuals and institutions that will be involved in this consortium. 
And our dream is that these groups will come together and do their own research, but also work collaboratively across centers to really increase the value of the research that's being done. And also, eventually, once we're up and running, to bring in other investigators who are interested in collaborating with the centers as well. So we're, as I said, we just funded these grants, got them out the door by the end of fiscal year 17, so we didn't have to turn the money back over to the Treasury, so we worked hard to get that done. Um, and we're just very pleased to have this launched and ongoing. So our long-term goals have not changed. Our long-term goals are to support and expand these collaborative centers as funding allows, to support the development of new therapies and treatments of MECFS, to support clinical trials down the road for MECFS, and ultimately to improve the health and the quality of life for all individuals with MECFS.